Folks, we're just a few days from uh, Winnipeg's preseason kicking off, and the Jets have had some training camp. They've had some scrimmages. Let's take a look at some of the line combos and dive into what it might suggest Rick Bonus's head is at for this upcoming season as the Jets prepare for maybe one of their most unpredictable and exciting seasons in recent memory. All coming right up on tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets. Or Locked On, the Hockey Jets, your daily podcast on the Winnipeg Jets. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends, and welcome to today's episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Harrison Lee, an avid Winnipeg Jets fan and an online blogger. You can follow me on Twitter at HLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. As always, thank you for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform of choice, including Apple, Spotify, Google, Megaphone, Odyssey, and YouTube. Doing so is completely free of charge and ensures you never miss another episode. But most of all, we really love and appreciate your support. Today's episode is brought to you by BetOnline.net. BetOnline has you covered the season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. BetOnline, it's where the game starts. Now, like I said at the top of the hour, uh, obviously the Jets are, are entering, well, you know, a bit of an interesting period where we're not really sure what to expect with this team. And, uh, you know, head coach Rick Bonus is doing his best to come up with some potentially new concepts for the Jets. Maybe not new in the sense of anything that's like earth shattering for the world of hockey, but for the world of Jets hockey specifically, maybe a little bit surprising. Uh, there were some comments that he gave to the press about how he wants to approach the season. And one thing that he sort of specified he wants to see more of is offensive activation from the defense, which I think is a really nice thing to hear. Um, he said they're going to have the green light to activate a lot more frequently and contribute to the forward scoring as well. So I feel like this, uh, at a very bare minimum, identifies one of Winnipeg's key weaknesses in earlier seasons. And based on, you know, the, the Jets kind of pumping Heinle's tires a bit and what we're seeing with Bonus trying to, you know, trying to talk about uh, one of Winnipeg's biggest deficiencies, it does suggest that the lineup is going to look very different and that Winnipeg's approach is going to be looking more at less defense from um, uh, a really defensive standpoint, but maybe defense through great offensive possession, which I think is always, for Winnipeg, the way to go. Let's be real. Winnipeg's defense can't really stop a lot. And I've seen some comments to some of my suggested lineups suggesting, you know, Winnipeg would get run over and that if you if you take out certain defenders, it's going to be a mess, and it might be the case, but I think the biggest problem is even if you put in your most resolute defenders on this team into the lineup altogether, the Jets' defense is still passable at most, and I think it's going to be one of the situations where, for bonus, he's going to have to pick one or the other. Do you want a defense that's maybe halfway okay, but doesn't really contribute a lot uh, going up the ice, or do you maybe want to chance it a little bit more, be a little bit more open-ended, and opt for a blue line that is mobile, is fast, and kind of leans on Hellebuck a little bit more to clean up the rest? I think under ordinary circumstances, I would have agreed with maybe having a slightly more conservative approach in how you compose your lineups. But I think with the, the Jets having Connor Hellebuck to be um, one of the biggest pylons uh, and pillars of this team to lean on, I am more okay with the idea of stretching the play, looking for more offensive opportunities, and quite frankly, taking risks. Uh, if it was anyone else in that, you know, obviously the Jets really wouldn't be in a position to where you could comfortably trust uh, a really run and gun style. But I've, I've advocated for that style for years, um, in part because the Jets just aren't built to play slower, really heavy hockey, not, not at their peak. Now, this team doesn't have as much foot speed as you'd hope. I think that is one thing that is very true about this year's construction. Uh, it's been true for the past couple of years. 
And I think that that is going to continue to be like an organizational philosophy. I mean, look at some of the players that they drafted uh, this past, uh, you know, rookie draft. Obviously, the Jets didn't really go for pure skating technique. Now, Brad Lambert, absolutely. He is an effortless skater. But then you look at, you know, a guy like Rucker McGroarty. Um, and McGroarty has some very interesting offensive skill sets and might genuinely be superb down low and in the slot with his creativity. But obviously, his mobility has been an issue throughout the early parts of his career. So, uh, you know, the Jets don't seem to be bothered by that. I mean, you, you saw that they took Cole Perfetti. And Perfetti, of course, I don't think his skating was as bad uh, as people have occasionally made it out to be. But it's it's not, you know, top end effortless edge work like what we're seeing with Lambert, right? Perfetti is a more patient skater, uh, a guy who thrives more in slower possession, who wants to kind of take the game at his own pace. And I think that that has expressed itself in the way that he approaches and works on the ice. So very impressed so far with Perfetti, obviously. And if that's the kind of approach that the Jets are comfortable with, sort of meshing skating styles and looking to still stretch the ice through passing and vision, well, I'm okay with that. And I, I think the Jets have a real opportunity here by activating the, activating their blue liners to extend those offensive zone possessions and really tire opposing teams out. Uh, the, the Jets, you know, depth lines might be more of a ground and pound type. So I think this is where your really creative blue liners like Heinola, uh, maybe if Pionk kind of finds his form again, him as well, Nate Schmidt. I think all of those guys can really offensively contribute. Uh, Josh Morrissey, of course, we know is definitely capable of racking up points. You know, he might not be the world's best power play scorer, but at even strength, he's got great vision. And it seems like he has identified a couple of areas around the faceoff circles where he does actually have a pretty decent release. So, you know, there is reason to think here that um, maybe Bonus is tactically aware of some of Winnipeg's biggest problems and is willing to push the team in the right direction. It, you know, I'm, I'm certainly more excited about him than I've been about uh, any of Paul Maurice's changes over the years. There was only one year that I felt Maurice really got it, and that was 2017, 2018. But right off the bat, Bonus really hasn't for me put a foot wrong. So I'm excited about that. But of course, like I said at the beginning, the they do have like a training camp gone going right now. They've had some scrimmage games, and it's showing us some interesting lineup combos that I think are really worth taking a look at because there may be one or two surprises here, especially in where Wheeler is being used and what it might mean for Winnipeg's top nine in just a few weeks here. We'll walk through those line combos and what I'm interested to see emerge from these pairings in just a little bit. But before we go any further, I do want to shout out our friends at partners at betonline.net. BetOnline is your number one source for your football betting info this season. Whether you're looking for college football or pro-level stuff, They've got all of the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, in-depth articles, and analysis on every game you can find. They've got stuff from the start of the season up until now, and they've also got stuff if you're looking more at futures than the present. And as always, Bet Online remains your continued source for all of your sport wagering information with live betting, up-to-minute scores, and everything you can imagine for every single sport out there. If you like MLB baseball, NHL hockey, um, of course, German soccer is even covered, Premier League football. They've got everything. I mean, they even have triple crown horse racing when those roll around. So they are a fantastic resource, not just a betting site, but a resource for you, for all of you sports heads out there who want to keep track of all your favorite sports. They've got all the information and podcasts, news, updates, everything you want, all in one centralized location. And they really are the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your favorite games and events. They've also got MMA, boxing, golf, you name it, they've got it covered. And if you don't love sports, they've also got Vegas casino games because they want everyone to have a little bit of fun. To get started, go to betonline.net on your laptop or mobile device to register for a free account right now because BetOnline is where the game starts. Hello, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets. Thank you for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. We are, uh, you know, continuing to look at Winnipeg's roster um, and, and some of the potential lineup combos. I tried my hand at assembling a lineup a while back. Um, but of course, you know, the Jets are going to have to weigh some of the changes that I'm suggesting with dealing with the veterans and, and not wanting to embarrass anyone and not wanting to piss anyone off that, you know, 
has been a really mainstay player. And I, I, I think in particular, Wheeler is one that I would say um, is kind of in this category. Now, we've all had our moments with Blake being uh, a little bit frustrated with how he has tried, you know, how he's tried to approach his ice time and stuff. But, you know, at the end of the day, I've always said I can't criticize a guy for wanting to be the breadwinner. And, and let's be real, you know, Wheeler a couple of years ago when he was in, you know, what, his late 20s or whatever, he was an absolute monster. Uh, really, the only problem with him is that just father time catching up. And I, I think that that, that has been um, tough to see him slow down. But I, I think there's this mistaken notion that, uh, you know, Wheeler, it, he never really contributed enough to this this franchise. I don't really agree with that at all. I think he was a like a fantastic player, fantastic ambassador. And while I do have questions about his leadership in the locker room and, and sort of the, the rifts that it caused, you know, there are some things that I would say I, I'm, I'm willing to put aside and let go in, in part because of how much he's already contributed to this franchise. And I think that there's still a way for him to be very valuable to this team. And based on the Team Steen and Team Howard Chuck lineups, we've got some interesting insights into where Bonus wants to play him. Uh, the Team Steen rushes over the past couple of days. They've had one or two changes as guys have kind of cycled in and out from rest. But the primary group that I think is worth taking a look at is Harkins, Lowry, Appleton, and Perfetti, Dubois, Wheeler. Uh, Harkins, Lowry, Appleton, for me, sounds like your third line. I think that that is probably what we're looking at here, unless the left wing spot becomes one where I think that there is still a decent amount of competition. Um, this unit is is about as pre- predictable as it, it, you know, you'd imagine it to be. Uh, you're not really expecting anything crazy. Um, I do think the left wing spot uh, on the third and fourth lines is maybe a little bit more open and in, open into like a ter- interpretation as to who might stand out during camp, which players really shine during preseason, which guys during these scrimmages really show off. But you know, beyond that, I, I mean, Lowry, Appleton working together, that's two peas in a pod, really. You've seen them attached at the hip. Uh, Cop and, and Lowry certainly played a lot together. So uh, if you imagine Appleton to be a little bit more stylistically similar to Andrew, then it's not really that much of a stretch to see them working together. But the big Jimmy Changa and the one that I think is worth highlighting is Perfetti Dubois-Wheeler, because this is the unit that uh, is going to get the most discussion. And I think it's worth thinking about whether or not this trio works together. Perfetti and Wheeler are not exactly Connor and Zvechnikov in terms of complementary wings. Now, I think that there are positives and drawbacks to this. Uh, the first thing that I think is really great is that you have two fantastic passers paired with a really strong center down low. And that means that if you get a good cycle game going, you're going to have a monster trio to try and contain. Perfetti is very crafty and very smart. And I think players like Dubois and Wheeler will actually be able to get on to the end of his passes as long as they're kind of on the same page and understand where his thinking is. You know, traditionally, Perfetti has had trouble at times connecting his passes because he's thinking about 20 steps ahead and you know, his line mates have to be on the same wavelength of intelligence because otherwise they're just going to miss it. They're not even going to be expecting it. And Cole is going to be feeding six, sick passes for assists that don't end up getting converted on because they don't even reach their intended targets. So I think this unit has the potential to be really dangerous. Um, the only thing that I wonder is when they're trying to transition the puck up the ice, uh, are they going to be able to actually get to the offensive zone on a consistent basis? My guess, my guess is like, yes, but, you know, we've seen with Shifley and Wheeler together how that changes Shifley's game to be considerably worse. Uh, Mark has kind of had to slow down his own game whenever he's play, paired with Blake, uh, and that does have some significant impacts both offensively and defensively when they're when they're attached together. So I'm curious to know if this lineup uh, trio holds once we head into the regular season um, and even through preseason. I want to see what this unit does. It, it makes sense to me in certain areas, but I just kind of have to see it in motion, especially against really fast teams and skaters who are maybe more wired like the Colorado Avalanche uh, with fast counters that put the Jets kind of on the back of their heels. So an interesting group. Um, obviously, I think that there are going to be different strengths and weaknesses there. But, you know, that does often or that does also leave bigger questions about the other group, which is Team Howard Chuck. And we'll talk about what those forward lineups mean and uh, maybe also take a look at some of the defensive pairings because I think there's some interesting things we can intuit from who 
uh, Bonus and the coaching staff have uh, attached together and maybe some interesting developments around where Heinola might be playing. Hello, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked On Jets. We are closing out tonight with some final thoughts on the scrimmage camps as we're heading just into a couple of days before uh, the start of preseason. And of course, in just a, a week or two, maybe a couple of weeks now, uh, the start of the NHL season itself. So we talked about Steen, uh, Team Steen's top six arrangement for the forwards. Uh, in terms of Team Howard Chuck, I mean, this is not as surprising, but you've got Connor Shifley Ehlers together and then Toninato, Gustafson, and Gagne. Lambert is a little bit further down the lineup playing with Torgerson and Zilkin. I think Brad has a chance to shine during preseason, but I think for the most part, the Jets are trying to make him um, stick out a year maybe with the Moose first and try to get his feet wet at the pro level before throwing him into the deep end with Winnipeg. I think that there's a chance he'll have his NHL debut this season, maybe uh, for like that, that, you know, however many games uh, you get for the trial. What is it like? 10 or like 13 or something like that before your ELC kicks in. Uh, I, I think they'll give him a shot to audition later, but I think at the start of the season, uh, they might want to be careful with him and ensure that they're giving him the most supportive environment where he can dominate, that he can get a lot of ice time and that he can continue to hone his game because already he's coming to camp looking really fresh, looking really confident. And I think you know, at the bare minimum, not directing him to the WHO is already a big confidence boost and a real sign of the Jets showing faith in him. Uh, obviously, that that move hasn't been announced right now, but I think given the group of forwards that he's playing with and given that he's already shown off so much uh, in some, some limited skating time with the camp groups, I think that there's a good chance he goes pro this year. Uh, at least North American pro. Of course, he's been playing pro hockey over in Eng or in Finland for a while now. But, you know, North American hockey, obviously a little bit of an adjustment and not quite the same thing. So as far as like the top six for uh, Team Howard Chuck is concerned, Connor Shifley Ehlers is a pretty natural uh, top line unit. Interesting one for me, because obviously you're not going to have a lot of defensive support here from Perfetti, but you are going to have blazing speed. And I, I think the the idea of uh, CSE as like a really good offensive scoring trio that's just constantly bombing up and down the wings, creating great one on one matchups and using that creativity and skill to just score, you know, uh, and, and shoot the Dickens out of goalies, I feel like is a really fun combo. Uh, I'm certainly willing to give it a shot. You know, when Shifley is more focused on just creating offense and stuff and not having to worry about um, defensive possessions going backwards. He's really at his best, and Ehlers, whenever he works with him, they tend to bring out the best in each other, so I think this trio could be really fun. And now that Connor's game has kind of taken another step forward in terms of understanding how to better use his line mates and really making the most of those scoring chances, I think that that is a great trio. Toninato, Gustafs, and Gagne could very well be um, Winnipeg's third or fourth line. I think Bonus is trying to figure out the right balance here uh, in terms of defensive stability with scoring output. I think he's very keenly aware that the Jets don't have a lot of offensive punch in the third and fourth lines. And so he's looking for different combos to really step up. And I think the idea of having Gustafson with Kanye is actually nice because it suggests he knows Gustafson needs skill to work with. And Kanye is an underrated scorer. I think he's always been um, a little overhated. He's a very good finisher. Uh, and he really brings some soft mitts that I think have been, again, are a bit underappreciated throughout his career. Uh, you know, he was always projected to be something else for the Oilers that he never really was. And ever since then, he's just been a reliable middle six producer that I think would work really well at inter introducing Gustafson to longer term NHL duties. So I'm excited about that. Ton of auto. I mean, you don't really, you know, um, expect a ton of defensive or like offensive value out of maybe he can bring some defensive contributions. But, you know, he's there to be a complimentary winger, maybe score a couple of points here and just anchor a, a role where there's some competition. I mean, Mikey Eisenman apparently has had a good camp from what uh, Murat Atash of the Athletic has indicated. Um, there's some other guys out there who might be fighting for a spot. You know, you're looking at uh, Christian Reichel, Jeff Malott, uh, maybe even Greg Morales. A lot of players looking for ice time, and the Jets don't have a ton to give. Now, where the Jets will have actually quite a bit of time to give uh, is a crowded blue line unit with players like um, Heinola, uh, Sandberg, and some other prospects all trying to filter in. But 
Um, I, I think there's one particular defensive pairing to me that has stood out. Uh, that is, or that there's actually two, sorry, two from team stain. You've got Dylan Heinola with Heinola playing on the right side, which is unusual. Um, I think Heinola is actually good enough to play on your offhand. Uh, he seems like he's very adaptable, very flexible. Um, and as a, like a super smart defender with great passing and vision and pretty decent mobility, I think he would potentially work well with Brendan Dillon, especially if Dillon does in fact benefit from bonuses, adjustments to the defensive systems. The other pairing that's interesting is Chisholm DeMello. Uh, if this pairing were to come to pass, I think it would be a very nice mixture of Chisholm's ability to be like a chaotic ball of energy and offense on the ice and DeMello's more patient approach that focuses more on being a really complimentary piece to somebody who's going to be the more aggressive puck carrier. It's kind of how you got Morrissey to function, and I think it's a, a very potentially fun pairing for the future. Um, for Morrissey's part, he's been he's been paired with Jonathan Kovacevic. Uh, this is kind of Kobe's last big chance, I think, to make a major impression on the organization and prove that he is uh, a potential, you know, top six option for this right side of defense. Uh, there's, you know, not a lot of great right-handed blue liners on this team, but there are enough already that it is, it is going to have to require some pretty impressive play from him to earn a spot. But if it pays off and if he works well with Morrissey, that would be super awesome because then you can kind of flex out those pairings and add a little bit more depth and it gives you way more tactical options. Um, you'd also be interested in maybe seeing Sandberg Schmidt get some runouts, but you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunities here for this defense to kind of have a really new look coming into the season. And if they're able to make three really good pairings, let's do it. I'm excited. I would be hopeful that it pans out because it can only portend good things for the Jets going forward. But of course, we won't know if all of this is going to mean anything until we start off the preseason this upcoming weekend. I believe the first game is against the Oilers. And uh, obviously, I'm looking forward to it. I hope you all are. Let me know your thoughts on what you think of the lineup so far and what the Jets have done with their their forward and defensive groupings. Be sure to let me know at HLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets on Twitter, as well as the YouTube comments below. But for tonight's episode, that is going to be all the time that we have. Thank you so much for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. Be sure to make your second listen, Locked On NHL. Our experts give you a daily 30-minute podcast on all things NHL all year long. You can stay up to date on everything in the world of hockey all at your fingertips for free. Be sure to like, follow, and subscribe right now. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Have a great night, and go Jets go.